Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello again. Uh, in the first uh, few units of module 5, we were looking at the role of script, language and the novel in the production of the nation, in the imagining of the nation and we looked at how the writers uh, from various languages, focusing on the writers in Hindi, we looked at how many of the uh, well-known writers of the period lend their support to this imagining of the nation in the production of the master narrative of the nation uh, through cleansing or through sanitizing their language of its Persia Arabic influence and played a major role in the imagining of the nation. In this particular unit, I would look at the cracking of the nation and again I would look at how the how language, uh, literature and fiction becomes complicit in this cracking of the nation and the emergence of micro-nationalist identities in which again writing plays a major role uh, and the same writing in the same language can be used to not only to construct the nation but also to crack the nation. So let's go back to, let's revisit the construction of the nation and we looked at the master narrative of the nation constructed by the founding fathers of the nation and we found uh, that over a period of time that uh, cracks began to emerge in this so-called unified fabric of the nation uh, through what someone uh, was a uh, leading scholar on nationalism, Bhakti Chatterjee has called the discontents of the nation. So who are the discontents of the nation and why did the cracks begin to emerge? We will not go into that because we examined that when we were talking about the emergence of micro-nationalist movements. But uh, we uh, did talk about how when the nation was, Indian nation was being produced, there was a new three nation theory, not a two nation theory and this three nation theory uh, when I spoke about the role of uh, script and languages I spoke about the demand the linguistic demand uh, which was for three nations so there would be a hin hin nation based on Devanagari and Hindi another on Urdu which was would be is Islamic nation and the third nation would be a Sikh nation but these linguist these demands were not made on the basis of uh, religious identities, they were made on the basis of language and script. But we found that this third nation was informed because the third demand for the Sikh nation wasn't accepted. So this was one example of the discontents. We also find cracks within the leadership and we know that this uh, unity which uh, the nation witnessed during the nationalist movement after independence or even prior to it, it, independence there were cracks within the le leadership, cracks which were patched over for the sake of uh, gaining independence and these cracks began to emerge gradually. Uh, so we are also aware of how some this uh, non-violent narrative of independence produced by based on the Gandhian paradigm was uh, 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 was foregrounded and other nationalist movements, uh, the more violent form forms of nationalisms or militant nationalisms were marginalized to the construction of this master narrative of non-violence resistance. We know the stories of the INA, we know the stories of Gadar, these repressed stories which have now been brought to light which are being recovered. 
And we also have the nation being critiqued or interrogated or questioned by uh, from the class perspective. Uh, we have rebellions of subalterns from the perspective of class, the peasants who feel that they have been shortchanged in, uh, in the distribution of the uh, gains of the nation. They also uh, divides emerging along the lines of caste, particularly the emergence of that Dalit movement where certain groups of people, subaltern groups including peasants and, and uh, caste, uh, those who were marginalized by their caste, the Dalits also protest against the, the so-called homogeneous nation, the unity and diversity narrative of the nation. And one major component of this discontent, one major uh, interrogation came from the women. Now, the women uh, question was very important during the nationalist movement and women were in fact appropriated in this anti-resistance movement. But the story of the nation remained a story, a male middle class upper caste story in which after the, after the gaining of independence, after the formation of the nation, the women were asked to return to the traditional roles and uh, erased from this history of the nation. So while they were encouraged to emerge in the public space during the nationalist movement, they were expected to retreat to the private space to safeguard tradition after gaining independence. Now, these voices of the others, the rise, this rise of the voices of the others, gendered, religious, caste others began to emerge. These voices, the, which were repressed during the construction, production of the myth and fantasy of the nation or the reality of the nation, whichever way we looked at, look at it, these voices begin to rise over the years. And because of the rise of these voices, cracks in the nation became gradually visible and erupted in micro-nationalist movements. So, this, so today in, in this module, I look at the sum of, I would not have time to look at all the small voices of the nation, uh, such as uh, different religious minorities or caste minorities or caste discontents or class discontents. But I would focus only on one particular voice of the nation which was repressed in the construction of the master narrative of the nation, uh, the voice of the women who have interrogated the gendered master narrative of the nation. And uh, once uh, again, the role has, the leading uh, role has been played by uh, writers writing in English. Uh, writers from a very elite background who write in English, female writers who have interrogated this gendered narrative of the nation in their own writings, writers such as Anita Desai, Nintara Segal, Shashi Deshpande and so on. But instead of focusing on the writers who write in English in this particular unit, I would focus on voices of the nation, vo voices of the women uh, and I would combine it with voices of the region because in the construction of the, so this narrative of the nation, the voice, this, the, the dominance of the center and the marginalization of the region also led to several regional discontents and the emergence of several micro-nationalist movements. So in the particular case study I would take up in this uh, unit would be representative of two discontents, the regional discontents and the gender discontents. So this narrative would combine the voice of the women and the voice of the region and yet another voice because unlike the writers uh, uh, the cl uh, who were uh, canonized by in, in the pr construction of the national culture or national literature, who, who emerged largely from, uh, who, who, who were mainly writers who were considered 
uh, serious uh, writers. Uh, they were writers who were extremely popular, and yet they were not given the due by the nation because of uh, the divide between uh, so-called serious literature, the can canonization of serious, uh, the so-called serious writing, and the marginalization of popular write writing. So this particular writer that I'm going to talk about combines in her writing and in her person three of these marginalized narratives, one of the women, two of the region, of the bhasha, not of the bhashas, but of the region, and the third of the bhashas as well. And the third is that of a popular versus classical or high culture. So I'm going to talk about a writer who is extremely popular, who enjoyed a popularity which, is, which was unprecedented and a, a popularity which continues even after her death. But let me f let's first listen to her daughter, Ira Pandey, who says, we still will live with the colonial burden, in spite of claims otherwise. You should have seen the hype that was created around William Dalrymple's new book, the crowds that came. But the reality is that only a very thin crust of the urban English-speaking population is getting to read these books. So she's making a case for the Bhasha writers. We met a lot of Bhasha writers earlier in the, um, in the first module where we saw how they helped in the construction of the nation. But now we're looking at, we, give, we are uh, relooking the Bhasha writers, all of whom were not complicit in the writing of the nation. Popular writing in Marathi, Kannada, Malayalam is being ignored. My mother's books, and we will meet her mother soon, my mother's books were being sold, printed on toilet paper. What will happen if we treat our own with so much contempt, she asks. The glitz and commerce of India shining is probably going to scare good writers away. Only those who are glib and well connected will get picked up. And then she uh, uh, summarizes the divide between English or Bhash and Bhashas, mainly the modern Indian languages, uh, spoken in different parts of India. And she says that around the time of independence, our regional Bhasha literature had a richer bank. We looked at this rich bank of Bhasha literature when we talked about the role of the novel in producing the nation. And we saw how the novels of Prem Chand, Bankim Chandra, and many others helped in the production of the nation. English writing didn't even have a status. Mulk Raj Anand had to go abroad for publishing. It's a reversal now. Most people don't even know the big names who are writing in Marathi. Our strength is our plurality. Why should we destroy what we already have? Some of the most modern, most real work in terms of the country is being done by the Bhasha writers. We owe it to them to translate their work to make it reach the larger reader audiences. Translations are what I want to do. This is what Ira Pandey says. Now we are going to look at the case study of one such writer from uh, who, write, who wrote in Hindi and how this writer constructs the region and who represents the small voice of the re region. And even though she was not canonized, she was not included in the canon of the writers who were honored uh, in, in the, and included in the canon of Hindi literature. She is a writer who enjoyed great popularity, not only her in her lifetime, but also after her death. We are talking about Ga Gaura Pant, popularly known as Shivani. She was born on 17th October 1923 and died in on 21st March 2003, better known as Shivani, who was one of the popular Hindi magazine story writers of the 20th century and a pioneer in writing Indian women-based fiction. So she's writing before any of the writers are writing in English. She was awarded at last the Padma Shri for her contribution to Hindi literature in 181982. Born on Vijaya Dashmi 1923, there's a Miss uh, uh, Brent, uh, it should be 1928, not 23, in 
Rajkot, where her father was a Divan. This is her daughter's uh, biography of her mother. She says, Didi's early, Didi, as they called the daughters, called her, Didi's early years were spent with her parents who moved from state to state as her father worked with the rulers of Archa and Rampur. When she was about eight, she and her brother and sister were sent by her grandfather, one of the founding faculty members of the Banaras Hindu University, to Shanti Niketan, where she spent 12 years. Tagore was a great influence on her life and often visited her family in Almora. Her husband, Shukdev Pant, was a teacher and later worked in the education department of Uttar Pradesh. They spent a substantial amount of time in Anital and moved to Allahabad and finally to Lucknow. Now, uh, she has this multicultural heritage as we can see, Sanskrit, Hindi, Bengali and uh, what, her, what is her writing about? Again, we have to go by her daughter's word who says, did these novels and short stories are set in Kumayu and have strong heroines, so almost always beautiful. When quizzed about this, she claimed she couldn't write to bear, she couldn't bear to write of ugliness in Lokale or, an, or in character. And almost all her, of her works are in print today and widely available across India. They're not only in print and available across India, but she has a big following overseas. So when we're talking about Bhasha writers, uh, we can think of several other examples, uh, not just Shivani, but the Bengali Mah writer Mahashrita Devi, who's, whose writing is taught in universities, several universities overseas, and she has become uh, s uh, the site for the exploration of the, the Bhasha versus English divide and the, uh, the divide versus subalternity and, uh, and, uh, and elitism. So it's uh, the, the popularity of these writers, uh, in the case of Mahashweta Devi Kurtzi, uh, the eminent post-colonial critic uh, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, who brought her writing to the attention of the academia, unlike Mahashweta Devi's writing, which is familiar to most students of English literature or post-colonial writing across the world, Shivani's writing found its way uh, across the world. Uh, she has uh, she has fans, uh, Hindi speaking or Hindi uh, knowing fans across the world, independent of this academic intervention, because one can find her e-books, one can find uh, people talking about her fiction uh, on the social media, people who are not only based in India, but who, who might not have had, have who, who are not her readers within the territory of India, but a very globalized readership which talks about her writing even today. So she garnered a, a massive following in the pre-television 60s and 70s as her literary works like her most famous novel Krishna Kali were serialized in Hindi magazines like Dharm Yog and Sattahik Hindustan leading her to her cult status as a Hindi magazine novelist. Uh, now through her writings she also made the culture of Kumayu somewhat known to Hindi-speaking Indians across the country. And I must share this anecdote. A leading writer from Arunachal uh, shared this story with me about how he would, uh, or when uh, he would wait for his copy of Dharma Yog uh, in his remote uh, 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 residence because he couldn't wait to read the next uh, next uh, se serialized version of one of her novels. So what, what was interesting is that her writing spanned the regions. Uh, in addition to the national readership, uh, all lovers of Hindi literature who were divided across the country, including in far away Arunachal Pradesh, were uh, were uh, uh, write, reading her writings in Dharm Yog, even though they might not have been officially disseminated in the canons of produced by the canons of Hindi literature. Uh, yeah, we can even think of uh, literary journals like Dharm Yog in, in, in Saptahik Hindustan in the 
in the production in addition to the novel, deserialized no several of the novels as we said even earlier uh, like um, um, thus the, 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 the Hindi novels which appeared as serialized versions through this periodical literature. We can also talk about the role of periodical literature in constructing the nation and creating these uh, literary communities which converged on the imagining of the nation and the debates on, uh, on the nation which took place on the pages of these periodicals. So, but what is important is that through her writings, she also made the culture of Kumayu somewhat known to Hindi speaking Indians across the country. And this is now, I would uh, conclude this unit with her, her importance to the writing of the region and uh, the appropriation of her writing in the construction of this region, which is now known as uh, Uttarakhand and uh, the identities of this particular region with the success of the micro-nationalist movement and the formation of a separate state. So I should bring you some images of the region and you can see why she, why she found beauty distasteful because as you can see the region is one of the most beautiful regions in the country and how her writing plays an important, how the role of not just fiction but, uh, but rituals, festivals, folk songs, poet, uh, f uh, f uh, folk dance in the production of regional identities in which Shivani's novels also become complicit. So uh, we have images of some Kumayunis here and we can see how the local uh, folk music, uh, folk song is important in the construction of regional identity. Uh, this is a newspaper report of 2004 and how f literature and origin is appropriated in the production of a particular regional identity. Con and we have the construction of the region through the holy and Holi, which is very different from the Holi in the rest of the ro in India, the Kumayuni Holi. And uh, connecting this with the earlier uh, discussion on the role of script, language, and identity, we can see how once again the same logic which was used in producing the nations, the three nations in Hindustan, Pakistan, and Khalistan, which didn't happen. Now, the same uh, logic of script and language is being used in the production of ethno-linguistic identities within the nation and the formation of regional identities such as in this graffiti, Kumayuni meri pehchan, Kumayuni meri zuban, Kumayuni sanskriti meri shan, Kumayuni vani mera naam. And uh, we have Kumayuni Vani Community Radio and we have so folk song. So with this we can see how fiction or writing, uh, we have to again return to the question, Anderson's question about the relationship between uh, script, language, novel and identity and we find how complicated it gets in the case of India where the initial role of script language and identity such as the uh, Arabic and Devanagari script as well as Hindi and Urdu language in the construction of the nations of Pakistan and Hindustan is complicated because in, uh, uh, in this deviant nationalism as Partha Chatterjee calls it, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between language and identity as in the case of European nationalisms because uh, we have s in India we have so many languages and because of this uh, is it possible to have a single nation based on a single language in the case of a nation which has multiple languages. So what is the nation that is being imagined through these language languages or through these printing these print communities or through the linguistic uh, fiction uh, communities of the novel what are the communities that are being imagined. Uh, it seems that in the production of the nation itself there seems to be some kind of confusion because when, when the writers are talking about producing identity through the nation, 
Are they referring to a particular ethno-linguistic, ethno-regional identity or are they talking about a particular national identity? Seems to me that there is a confusion about what is the nation that is being produced, say, in the writing of a Bengali writer like Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, who has become uh, the site for the, for, for the debate on the production of Indian nationalist identity. Was he talking about Indian nationalist identity or was he talking about Bengali identity? Was, it, uh, was his writing important in the production of a Bengali nationalism, a Bengali nation or an Indian nation? Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, it's more complicated than it seems, but uh, what I wish to point out is uh, how the writing from the region is, um, there seems to be a kind of schizophrenia, which is sometimes secretive and sometimes dis disjunctive, because in some cases, this writing from the region or ethno-linguistic writing or a writing of fiction, the novel in Indian bhashas, sometimes it is accretive uh, with the Indian nation or Indian national identity or it is important in the imagining of the nation as in the case of Bengali fiction of Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. How nas national identity and the imagining of the nation itself is mapped on, on the identity produced to the novel or to the novels of Bang Bankim Chandra Chatterjee or his poetry or his uh, other writings. Whereas in other cases, sometimes writing can be disjunctive or it can be accretive. So taking the case of Shivani or Gaurapan, we see her as a product of a nationalist identity through her uh, very diverse uh, education, through her uh, residence or domicile in different parts of the country, her exposure to different uh, ling uh, languages, regions, cultures, literatures. So she, in her body and in her person, she forms this very uh, syncretic, very eclectic cultural identity based on the amalga amalgamation of a uh, very basic, um, a pan-Indian Sanskritic identity which was being produced during the period. Along with that, she is, uh, shows a strong Bengali influence uh, as well as Kumayane uh, influence. So, uh, to me, it seems to uh, uh, presage or it seems to uh, exemplify that movement away from the nation, which is both, both uh, micro nationalist in the sense uh, that her as, as it points to her Kumayuni roots, as well as nationalist. So, a writing which, uh, which combines a strong ethno-regionalism, very ethno-linguistic identities along with a national identity which is mapped on an ancient Indian language, Sanskrit, is reflected in her writings and how this writing uh, cha uh, challenges many other divides such as the divide between the center and the nation, between uh, writing in English and the bhashas between writing by male writing and fe uh, you know the gender narrative of the nation and between the so-called serious literature and popular fiction.